Saludos. Welcome back. It's your host, Gabe Morales. We have been covering Mexican Mafia members over the past 60 plus years. I don't know if I mentioned it before, but some people have commented who appear to be either former convicts or even maybe retired cops and wondering what list do I work off of. Just for your information, I have reports from Bill Hankins and Smokey Thomas from the 1960s. As of 1971, my mentor tracked the Mexican Mafia extensively, probably was the most knowledgeable cop on the Mexican Mafia from the early 70s to the late 70s. But then he got blackballed and, and basically forced out of Califas. I have a list that has hundreds of prison gang members from 1974. It was on the old teletype. When they were just trying to figure out the prison gangs, a lot of those guys, I believe, were just associates. But they definitely were in the mix that when the feds got involved, they started using their toys and started doing wiretaps and putting money to put people on these guys. The mid 70s was about the time, too, when a lot of the guys started getting out of prison. They started releasing them due to new laws. And then, of course, in the late 1970s, as the validation system was improved, they started locking these guys down in the security housing units. In the late 1970s, I actually encountered some Mexican Mafia members who were trying to kill me. So I've been tracking them since then. I also was privy to prison gang task force reports, as well as BOP reports. And I also got reports from LA County Jail, San Diego County Jail, etc. So in answer to that question, my list consists of individuals documented by multiple departments and multiple sources. And like I said before, I usually don't go off just one agency pegging them as such. So some of these guys go way back, may have only been in the MA for a couple months, and other people have been in there for decades. So the ones who were only in it for a little while, you may not have heard of. And the ones that are more famous and been around a while, I'm sure a lot of you guys heard of. A lot of you guys said, I don't need to explain myself, but for some of you who may not know how I gained my knowledge, I was schooled by a lot of good gang investigators, as well as convicts out of the yard when I worked in CDC 1987 and 1993, during which time I read a lot of C-files. For those of you not familiar, C-files is a confidential section in the file that usually has a lot of gang-related reports, prison incidents, killings, who was associated with who. As individuals debriefed or police intelligence came in, this information was placed in their C-files. So lucky for you guys, that's it for my intro. I don't have a sermon for you today. So I'm going to get right into it. First we have, then there was Chino Loera from Tunerville. He had a D number, 31407. He was involved in the MA at least as a camarada, and I recall him being a hitman in New Folsom Violence Control Unit in 1991 when I worked there. And I'm not sure what happened to him after that. There was a Edward Guero Greenice Lopez from Florencia. He had a B number, 1943. He was affiliated with the MA by at least the early 70s. And I understand stab NF member Tarzan Casaneda in July 1972. It was made MA at that time for that hit. But I understand that he later on testified against the MA, so he was killed in March 1973 by the Carnales. He was given a pipe blow and garroted by Dan Perez, then stabbed to death by Chente Gutierrez and Huero Shai. There was a Fernando Bernie Lopez out of Ontario with the Black Angels. He had an E number, 95105, then came back with an AB number, not as an Aryan Brotherhood. I mean, his number was AB, 7404. He was active in the MA in the mid-90s and then paroled at the end of 2011. And I'm unsure what happened to him. There was a Gustavo Trigger Lopez from San Diego 28th Street. He had a D number, 69451, and was also an MA hitman at New Folsom. He then was later on moved to Avenal State Prison. And I show is no longer in custody, at least on the D number. There was a Hector Pirate Lopez from Ontario Black Angels. He had a C number, 97795, and was MA by the 1990s. I show that he was no longer in custody as of at least 2012. There was John J.T. Lopez from Santa Ana. He had a B number, 72166, and was involved with the MA in the mid-1970s, got out, and committed a bank robbery, whereby he was arrested in April of 1978 for the robbery he had committed in Garden Grove. He ended up going to the feds, whereby, I understand, he killed an NF associate by the name of John Charles Hughes. JT, along with fellow MA member Ruben Sanchez, killed Hughes on November 20th, 1979, at Lompoc. 
JT was released in October 1981, whereby he was murdered in 1987 with his girlfriend by Aryan Brotherhood member Charles Martz. Then there was Louis, a.k.a. Rock and Roll Little Louis Lopez, who was from Jardim. He was affiliated with the MA in the 1970s at San Quentin and moved to San Quentin's Adjustment Center in 1971. It was there in the Adjustment Center that Rock on Lou, along with fellow MA member Bala Talamantes, assisted the Black Gorilla family during the incident where George Jackson escaped and was later killed. During this incident, multiple inmates and staff were killed. He then was housed at the California Medical Facility in Vacaville in 72 and released in the mid-1970s. As I recall, he came back with an E-number, 78627, and came into the Violence Control Unit. I'm almost positive this is the same guy because I remember when he came to the unit, all the MA shouted, right on, rock on, Lou. But I understand he died a couple years later at Pelican Bay State Prison due to a serious illness. It was Manuel Mapa Lopez from Eastside Clover. His life of crime was covered recently on Police and Fire Publishing, which did a very good job of covering his early criminal history and how he was basically raised by the state. I highly suggest you check that out to get a better picture of Mapa, since I don't have time to go into details here today. He had an A number, 81876, and was born in 1928, making him one of the older MA members when he joined in the mid-1960s. He was housed at San Quentin in 1973, but soon acquired a rat jacket, and I understand died from bad junk in the late 1970s. I heard his favorite saying was, don't be so mean. He had a mean-looking mug, that's for sure. It was Rafael Curly Lopez. I'm not sure what body he claimed, but he had a C number, 6443, was born in 1956. He was active in the MA in the 1980s, and it still showed him being in the mix as of 2004. There was Ronald Huero Lopez. I'm not sure what body he claimed either, but he had a V number, 71562, was born in 1954. He was MA in the mid-90s, but had been paroled by 2012. There was Luis Termite Lopez Castro from 18th Street. He had an F number and hit CDC around 2006. I show he was housed at High Desert State Prison in 2016, was transferred to Corcoran in 2021, and is currently housed at California State Prison, L.A. County, in Lancaster. There was Robert Tolo Lopez Cheveria, who was out of Santa Paula, 12th Street. He had a C number, 6986 and was born in 1956. He hit CDC around 1979 and was known as being a big dope dealer. He was made him in the 1980s and at one time was sold with Gato Marquez at Folsom. He was housed at Pelican Bay for many years and then was moved to Sentinella for several years and most recently has been housed at Richard Day Donovan in San Diego. It was Emiliano Tonito Lopez Zapata, who was from Eastside Wilmas. Originally, he was in the Tupi Hernandez car, but after Tupi fell from grace, he started riding under the Topo Peters car, and I understand was close to Boxer, who was one of Topo's right-hand men. He was housed at Pelican Bay when it opened in 1989 and stayed there for many years, where he became heavily involved in taxing Sureño Vargas in his area, meaning the harbor area. He then was moved to Calipatria in 2016. It was suspected that his wife was a rata, and my understanding is that he was ordered to kill her. He himself was killed by Sureños in February 2016 at Calipatria, which a lot of people discuss is supposed to be against the rules because supposedly only a carnal can take out another carnal. So the jury is still out on that. There's been several documented cases where Sureños have assisted MM members in homicides, but not many whereby Sureño Camaradas carried it out alone. Unless, of course, they actually were Mexican Mafia members, just not validated as such yet. So you guys can debate that one. I'm staying out of it. There was Leonel, a.k. Wizard Laredo, from Florencia 13. He had a J number, 12113, and, of course, was very close to the Castellanos brothers, as well as Juan Topo Garcia, all who were considered Los Tres Reyes. I understand that Wizard put in a lot of work and made a lot of hot money for La M. I understand that he has some beef with other canales over taxes, in particular, Huero Verde from Verdugo. He was also involved with some drama behind some movidas by Chavo Perez. Understand that Wizard has some influence down in Tiwas, where Evo Madrigal was recently killed. Not saying he was involved in that. I'm staying out of that one too. Just saying, in case you didn't know. Then there was Jose Cartoon Losa out of Cantaranas. I mentioned him when I mentioned the Solo Gonzalez murder case. 
cartoon was close to the Gobbledones, who also hailed from Cantaranas. I understand he was hit in April 2013 by Sureños, who were possibly loyal to Solo. Moved to Sentinella in 2021, he then stood trial on a federal case at the LA Metro Detention Center, whereby he was charged on a federal case and given a life sentence. He was then moved to USP Atwater in California, where he's been housed for the last couple of years. There was Jose Cruz, Jimmy Joe Lucero, a.k.a. Noodles, who had ties to New Mexico, L.A., and Seattle, Washington. He had a B number, 444725, and was affiliated with the MA in the 1970s. He hit CDC in the 1960s and grew up in New Mexico, where he had connections to guys like George Padilla, and individuals who were involved with the Sindicato Nuevo Mexico. He was first incarcerated as a juvenile in 1953 and was also housed at the penitentiary at Santa Fe, New Mexico in 1955. He also did some time in Colorado DOC in the late 50s and paroled in 1961 to Albuquerque, whereby he took off for L.A. in 1967. He was involved in multiple robberies and dope deals with the M.A. I interviewed Jimmy Joe at length regarding his career with the M.A., and I even went to visit him, unbeknownst to me, in the late 1970s when the Pinto program at El Centro de la Raza sent us to Walla Walla, where he was housed, and where he ran the Chicano Club. There's a very interesting story in my book, The Life and Times of Abata Loco, about that. I don't have time to get into it right now and get sidetracked, but just know that you will probably be surprised about what happened there. And then again, maybe not. When I asked Jimmy Joe if he knew Cheyenne Cadena, he said, oh yeah, I was there when he was killed. And after that, we say, yeah, they're shy in the sky. All the canales would walk around saying, they're shy in the sky, he would say, kind of reminiscing and feeling bad about what the NF had done to his homeboy. He continued to be housed at Folsom through the mid-70s, whereby you could see on his back, Folsom and Mafia Mexicana. I actually took this picture, which many people have used in their presentations. It kind of trips me out, but I see a lot of pictures in my presentations. Some of these individuals are individuals who talked bad about me in the past. But oh well, I've always tried to give credit where credit is due. Whereby he is seen in this iconic picture with all the heavyweights, including Chavo Perez, Robot Salas, Joe Morgan, Richie Ruiz, Huero Buff, Rube Soto, and Tati Torres, as well as others. So yes, there is Mexican Mafia that have been documented in other states. Like I said, he ran the Chicano Club. He was the number one guy in Washington State, considered the godfather of the MA in Washington State. And I've seen communication where guys in California were talking about, we got noodles up in Washington State. And also, he is seen on the far left in the group picture in the federal BOP, where he was also active with Canales, California Mexican Mafia. He ended up getting out and busted in Washington State on the three strikes law. He was the only guy when I worked at the King County Jail that I ever saw in his special notes at the end of his file that per director Ray Coleman was never to be a trustee. What he had been doing was he was running a dope operation out of the fourth floor where the laundry was located. And he was putting special packages in the pockets meant for certain individuals throughout the jail. So the trustees basically moved his dope for him throughout the jail. This ended up being discovered and he was put in a high security area and that note was put into his file. I ended up seeing Jimmy Joe during a disciplinary hearing, basically the King County Jail equivalent of a 115. He had been written up for passing out extra food in the units to his homies. And when I asked him how he pled, I remember him saying, what could I say, Morales? I'm a convict. You guys weren't supposed to make me a trustee, remember? It's your guy's fault. I can't help it. I had to laugh. I found him guilty. <laughs> I can't remember what I gave him. I think three days segregation, but and put him back where he belonged in a high security area. But he was right. Jimmy Joe, a.k.a. Noodles, ended up getting popped on a three strikes law. As I recall, he was stealing some cigarettes at a store, and when the store owner tried to stop him at the door, he shoved him down on the ground and ran away. So the theft charge was kicked up to robbery, and since he had so many priors, he would have had 13. They had passed the three strikes law in Washington State following California's moves, and he ended up getting incarcerated for life over a pack of cigarettes, believe it or not. I understand when he was in Washington, D.O.C., he would have an entourage protecting him with Sureño Soldados and was considered to be royalty. I'm not trying to glamorize these guys. I'm just telling you how it was there. He ended up dying of old age and probably due to decades of heroin abuse in February 2001. There was Larry Lucero out of Ontario who had an H number, 12790. I don't believe he was related to Jimmy Joe, but you never know. 
He was documented as being an active MA in the mid-1990s. There was Frankie Scarecrow Lujan at a Redondo. He had a T number, 20450. Understand that he did some 187s for La MA. And as I mentioned in my previous episode, under the K last names, was the crime partner of Pelon Knighton. Scarecrow Luha was moved to Kern Valley State Prison, where he did time in 2012, and is currently at Valley State Prison, located in Chowchilla. There is Joe Luna, who I also understand was a killer for La Emma. He came out of Monte Flores and had C number 34178. I remember meeting this guy, and I heard that he tried to take out a CO that I knew. As I recall, it's at Soledad, but ended up not carrying out the hit and locking it up. And finally, we have Manuel Rocky Luna from Hazard. His history goes way back to the 1960s. He had B number 28583 and was active with the MA in San Quentin in 1972. Understand that he escaped from CIM in May of 1972. He also was involved in the homicide in, in Rosemead, California of George Felix, which was carried out by Choco Montiano and Beto Valles understand that the body then was rolled up in a carpet by Rocky Luna, placed in a car which was set on fire. This happened in February 1977. He was housed at DVI in the 1980s, as well as Folsom, and I think rolled around that time. Then came back with a C number, 9235. Ended up getting charged on possession of stolen property with Victorio Murillo in 1990. I believe he felt he was protected by Joe Morgan. But after Joe died, I understand he became involved in a beef with Topa Peters and became considered no longer in good standing. He also was an advisor on the movie American Me, which I know Joe would not have approved of. And I'm sure Topo looked at that as a sign of betrayal. He ended up being killed by Pee Wee Aguirre on August 7th, 1993. My understanding is he was in a car and Pee Wee let Rocky's female companion live by putting his finger up to his lips in a hush motion just before he capped Rocky. And so there it goes, whether you want to call it bad luck or bad karma, what comes around goes around. And so Rocky Luna then became expendable by the Mexican Mafia, just like so many before him had become. I hope you enjoyed this episode and learned something new. Don't forget, whatever you do will come back upon you. If not now, one day you will be held accountable, be it karma or by God. I hope that makes you think a little bit about what you do in this life. For now, this is Gabe Morales signing off for Gangsters, Cops, and Politicians.